Hello and welcome back to Information Technology Fundamentals. In this lecture we're going to review the use of access controls to help us secure our environment. So we're going to dis distinguish between identification, authentication, authorization, and accounting in our control systems. We're going to look at the different types of authentication and how to use them to provide strong authentication. We're going to look at the best practices for choosing pack passwords. And lastly, we're going to look at encryption technology and how they're used for authentication and access control. So if we're going to control access to our network, there's some things <laughs> and some terminology we need to define ahead of time. One is that when we talk about an access control system, we're going to have subjects and objects. So subjects are users or software processes or anything else that's going to request access to a resource. An object is going to be the resource that the subject is asking for access or permission to use. So they could be a network, uh, a server, a database, a file, a printer. There's lots of examples of this. And when we make that list of what a subject, what object a subject can use, we're going to call that an access control list. The four main processes in creating an access control system are identification, identification. So we have to have an account or an ID that verifies the user. Authentication, proving that the subject is who or what it claims to be when it attempts to uh, access the resource. Authorization, so that's going to be the rights and permission the subjects should have to use those objects and enforcing those rights or permissions. And accounting is tracking the authorized and unauthorized usage of a resource. Uh, sometimes we'll call that auditing as well. And that's usually done by the use of a log file. The idea of least privilege is a very important concept in security. We're trying to make sure that each user has exactly the rights and permissions they need to perform their job. We don't want to give them any more because that becomes a vulnerability or a risk. The other idea is implicit deny, which means that by default, you don't have access to anything and that the uh, IT department or whoever's in charge of the uh, creating the access control list has to give you permission to use anything on the network. So we have to have a plan in how we're going to grant access and who is going to give access or rights or permissions to everyone on the access control list. This should be a uh, written plan and it's going to uh, follow one of, the, one of these uh, methods. So discretionary access control is based on ownership. So the owner is in charge of who is going to be able to use the resource. If I create a file, I get to decide who else is going to be able to use the file. Role-based access control means that the company or organization looks at your job or your role on the network and in the computer system, and based on that role, you are granted or allocated permissions to use certain resources. Mandatory access control is based on the idea of security clearance and levels and labels. So that means if you have top secret clearance, you can see everything that's top secret or secret, etc. That is called mandatory access control. Rule-based access control is going to be any sort of uh, model where the policies for access are determined by the system rather than by users. The classic example of that is the Windows UAC, which says, although you might be an administrator, every time you go to install a new program, I'm going to ask you for permission. So accounting is really just the audit trail of how the rights have been exercised or used and it keeps track of many things but we're usually going to call this a log system. There's a lot of different ways that logging systems work. Uh, in the end the IT department or in a peer-to-peer -peer network the owner of the computer is going to decide what they want to log. 
the log will typically uh, keep track of the time and the user and what they accessed uh, or if they were unable to access something as well. Very important when there, a security event happens to have a good logging system in place. Non-repudiation is the idea that somebody can't deny that they did something on the network. So if our logging system says that Joe logged into this resource and used it, non-repudiation says we know that's a fact. And we can use a few different tools along with our logging system to verify that, including uh, video, biometrics, signatures, receipts, etc. So uh, our computer systems all have different types of user account types. And it ensures that the identity of someone using the computer is validated. And along with that, as we talked about earlier, if I am administrator, I'm getting a certain set of permissions. If I am a regular user, I get a certain set of permissions. And to make sure that we have these account types uh, set up properly, we're going to have a mandatory logon of our computers. We just can't turn it on. We actually have to have a username and a password. By default, on any Windows computer, we have uh, some default accounts. One is the administrator. The administrator, of course, has complete control over the computer, and it should be protected by a strong password. The guest account in Windows should be disabled by default. It has been uh, shown to be a, a vulnerability, but it is still available, uh, but a good practice is not to use it. And of course, we have the user account, which is created during setup. Uh, frequently, it is a local account, although in Windows 10, it is now accessed. Uh, Microsoft would like you to use your Microsoft account to log in. There's pros and cons to both of those. I prefer to use a local user versus having it connected to my Microsoft online account. That's going to be for a peer-to-peer computer in a client server the user account is going to be connected to the to the uh, server which is going to give the permissions uh, for the user so microsoft supports something called group accounts this helps when there's a large number of users that are essentially getting the same set of privileges. So for example, if we have the accounting department, instead of assigning each set of privileges to all the people in the accounting department, it's going to be much easier to put them into an accounting group, which then they will receive their privileges from the group. Now, a user account can be a member of multiple groups. So if you have someone who works in the accounting department, but also has to deal with the shipping department, perhaps they're in both the accounting and the shipping uh, group accounts, and then they would have access to more resources that way. On a local computer, Windows has a couple of default group accounts. Administrators, so any user account belonging to this group has complete control over the computer. And standard users, which have access to the Microsoft Store apps, uh, some basic configuration display and input settings, but they're unable to do things like install software, uh, configure their hardware, or changing certain system properties in the uh, settings. There are multiple ways that we can gain authentication in both on both our local computer, on a network computer, and in fact, on websites. Authentication factors are something you know, something you have, something you are, somewhere you are. So we're going to pick uh, we're going to look at each one of these. So something you know is typically going to be a password. Maybe it could be a personal identification number, a pattern lock, uh, or it could be even PII, personally identifiable information, uh, coupled with security questions. So that's something you know. Something you have is going to be like a hardware token. Uh, you might have seen these uh around, but you can have these little key fobs that generate a number every 60 seconds, and they allow you to uh, have something. And if you don't have this hardware uh, token, then you're not going to be able to get into the uh, website or computer. A software token is going to do the same thing, only it's going to use uh, software to do it. Uh, 
Google Authenticator on your smartphone. Uh, there's several others. Duo are examples of this. So instead of having to have some separate type of device, now you have your, uh, you do this through software. Something you are is typically a biometric uh, recognition system. Uh, fingerprint, iris, retina, facial features are are uh, common. Maybe uh, many of you are using this on your phone. Um, most right now support fingerprint, and Apple has gone to facial recognition as well. There are some considerations when we talk about this. Uh, one is privacy, and two is false positive and false negatives. So that rate of false positive and false negatives tells us how effective the biometric system is, and we have to have a way, uh, if the system isn't working, to still get in and get authenticated. We don't want to have biometrics being the only method to authenticate into a system and somewhere you are. So that means we can look at your geographic location and determine what you have access to. Uh, with a smartphone, we could, for instance, say as a company that if anyone goes outside of the United States, we're not going to allow them to have access to our network. But inside a company, we could even do it by having uh, computers in a certain room only have access to certain, uh, certain resources. If we look at how certification testing works, that means that the only place that you can take the test is in this one particular room. And if you're not in that room, you're not allowed to take the test. So somewhere you are can also be used as an authentication method. When we combine the multiple uh, authentication methods together, that's where we get two factor or we can even have three factors. So the more factors we have for authentication, the less likely it is that an unauthorized user is going to get onto the system. Single sign-on is pretty popular right now, and it means that a user only has to authenticate once to have access to multiple resources. Uh, instead of having to, each time you want to go to a different database or a different resource, re-logging re on. Uh, we see this on the web quite frequently. Uh, Microsoft does it with their single sign-on, uh, but Google also does that. You can go to different websites and sign on with Google. Uh, so there's already multiple services doing this. If we're doing it locally, we're using something called Kerberos on a Windows domain. Well, let's take a look at encryption and its purpose in a computer network. And the purpose of uh, encryption is to keep information private so that even if somebody saw the ones and zeros go past and they're able to capture it, they can't make any sense out of it. So that is what encryption is. And we have a couple of different ways that we can go about doing that. But let's define a couple pieces to it. One is plain text. So that is the unencrypted message. After the message is encrypted, it's going to be called ciphertext. So that is the encrypted message. And the cipher is the algorithm or the math that's used to encrypt and decrypt the, the message. So when we talk about encryption, we have uh, some basic types, hashing, symmetric, and asymmetric encryption. So symmetric encryption is when both the sender and the receiver have the exact same key for encrypting and decrypting the message. Symmetric encryption is very fast and it's used to do uh, both network and storage uh, encryption. Common ciphers for this are uh, 3DES, AES, uh, although AES is the most commonly used one at the moment. And the stronger or the longer the key size, the more difficult the encryption is to break. Now, the problem with symmetric encryption is when we have Alice or the sender, Alice, and the receiver, Bob, uh, don't know each other to begin with. And perhaps they live in different parts of the country. So for Alice and Bob to have the same key, how are they going to get it? If Alice is in New York and Bob in uh, California, how are we going to get that key to do the symmetric encryption? So that's the... Uh, 
a problem with symmetric encryption. So one of the ways we're going to fix that is through the use of asymmetric encryption. Now we have two people, Alice and Bob, that don't know each other. So we're going to add another key and use some different math. So we're going to have a public key that everyone can see. And when Alice encrypts her message using the public key, the only way it can be decrypted is with Bob's private key. So now Alice and Bob can communicate uh, securely without having to know each other in advance. Now, the problem with this is it's slow. So we're only going to be able to send a small amount of data this way, uh, but it'll solve the encryption pro uh, the uh, key pro distribution problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to start a session with asymmetric encryption, and we're going to use that uh, technology to send the symmetric key to both people. And then we'll use symmetric encryption to do the rest of the transmission. So we have one other piece of the puzzle that we need to solve with encryption and in particular websites. And that is, how do we verify the uh, website is who they say they are? And we do that through the public key infrastructure. And what happens is a website is given a digital certificate, which is issued by something or a company called a certificate of authority. And the certificate of authority investigates the company, makes sure that they are who they say they are. They then issue a digital certificate and the digital certificate contains the company's public key, which allows the symmetric session to be set up. So we're going to use the public key and asymmetric encryption to get the symmetric key to both parties. The public key infrastructure makes a website a trusted source. And the most common asymmetric encryption is based on this uh, RSA cipher. And if you go to a website, you will see in the uh, address bar uh, a little padlock. If you click on it, you can see the actual certificate of authority and verify that the website is owned by uh, the company that has the uh, certificate. So now we, we have a, another situation where we want to digitally sign something to authenticate it. So this is a little bit uh, kind of the reverse of what we saw to begin with. And in this case, we digitally sign something by using our, our private key and a public key is used to decrypt it. If I sign something with my private key, the only possible way to decrypt it is to use the public key. And in that way, the person who receives uh, whatever the document is can be assured that I indeed was the one who signed it. The last concept in our encryption is, has to do with hashes. So hashes are commonly referred to as a one-way function, and they're used to guarantee the integrity of the data. So if I want to make sure the data that I downloaded or that someone sent me has not been tampered or altered with, I'm going to use a hash. And a hash has a fixed length a string that comes out of this mathematical function. In, in in one sense, it really makes a serial number. So whether the, the uh, data is 4 gigabytes or 4 megabytes, the end result of the hash is, say, always 160 bits. By using this, uh, we can do a few different things with it. One is guarantee the integrity, but two, we also use this for the storage of passwords. So if I type a password into a password field, the next thing that happens is it is hashed and the hash is stored, not the actual password. The next time I go to log in, I type in the password, the computer hashes it, and tries to match the hash with what's saved on the server. This works really great, uh, as long as you're using a long enough password. So we're using hashes to uh, verify the integrity of our data and to store our passwords. There's several different types. Uh, SHA and MD5 are some common, but there are many other cryptographic hashes that are in use today.
So we need to use encryption to protect our data in various states. Uh, there's really three states of data, data at rest, data at transit, and data processed. Uh, like in this book, we're only gonna worry about data at rest and data at transit. So if we wanna protect our data at rest, we can go ahead and encrypt our whole hard drive, which would be very uh, common. We might also decide to just uh, encrypt a file or a folder or a database so we can do the whole thing or we can pick out little individual pieces. Data at rest is protected by symmetric encryption. Uh, we don't need asymmetric encryption to use data at rest. And of course data at transit which is when we're transmitting data over the network. Uh, we're going to use a variety of different encryption protocols SSL and TLS which use asymmetric and symmetric encryption together. And lastly, we can use something called a virtual private network or a VPN. And a VPN connects the components and resources of two private networks over a public network. That's why it's called a virtual private network. So we're using a public network, typically the internet, and we're in fact creating a private network inside of it that nobody can see. This is frequently called tunneling. Is it possible to crack a password? Absolutely. Even though the password is um, hashed, if it's short, it's actually pretty easy to crack. Now, typically what we find is people say, well, we're use if your password is this long, it's going to take 47,000 years to crack the password. But that's not actually true how most um, bad actors would go about doing it. They would use a, one of these other approaches, uh, dictionary or rainbow tables, which means a dictionary approach is simply trying a whole bunch of different words that are in the dictionary in combination with letters and numbers. And brute force just means we're simply going to try every letter and number combination. It's pretty slow, not used very often. Bad, bad actors have discovered that using a dictionary approach is much faster to decrypt passwords. How do we combat against the cracking of passwords? Well, one, we want to make the password long. Two, we want to use complexity, and we don't want to use dictionary words, and we want to mix alphanumeric and symbol characters. Uh, if we use, like, the first letter out of a phrase, it's easy to remember but hard to guess. Uh, of course, we don't want to share our passwords, and we want to change them periodically. Best case or best use is going to be, have a unique password for each account. However, in this day and age, that's pretty much not going to happen. We all have so many different accounts that need a password. If we had a different password for each one, we don't really have an effective method for keeping track of them. There are things called pass managers uh, fillers that will help you on your local computer store your passwords so you don't have to remember them. Um, and many web browsers do this as well. And that can be okay, but uh, like in Firefox, uh, it by default st stores your passwords in plain text. You have to do something extra to get it to encrypt them so somebody else can't see them. Which means if someone has access to your computer and knows a little bit about Firefox, they could easily in a couple of seconds download all your stored passwords. I'm not sure about all the other um, browsers, but I know Mozilla has that uh, that problem. So <clears throat> we can use a password managers. So in this le lesson, we distinguish between identification, authentication, authorization, and accounting in our access control systems. We looked at our different authentication factors and how they can be used in combination to provide strong authentication. We looked at the best practices for passwords, and we reviewed encryption technologies 